Welcome. It's the private life of Peg Lynch. I'm James Lilacs, and I'm with... Astrid King, and I am Peg Lynch's daughter. Oh, no, you're so much more than that. I am. I will be playing Peg Lynch, my mother, in this episode, along with all the others, which you're used to by now, I hope. Well, so far you've heard the story of a young girl from a small town in Minnesota who rose to the top of the top of the media world. King, queen of New York radio. She had her own national radio show. She did, and along with that, she had many admirers. A bevy, you might say. I'm sorry? A bevy of admirers? A bevy of admirers. Some of them had to be kept secret, too. Well, one of them did. Well, wait a minute. She had a secret affair with some dashing Hollywood star? Is that what you're telling me? Oh, I'm not going to give that away. You're not? We have to listen to find out who this is? You do. Okay, well, I guess you'd better tell us. We're also going to find out some of the other people who found her work remarkable, like, uh, oh, James Thurber, as we're going to hear in a second. I mean, I remember hearing this and thinking, you know, if there's anyone less inclined to compliment another comic writer, it's another comic writer. But Thurber knew talent when he saw it and heard it, and Peg was talent. So let's continue on now with The Private Life of Peg Lynch. The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert, starring Peg Lynch and Alan Bunn. And presented by ABC. Thurber said to me, you write about life's frustrations. I said, yes, but it's not having frustrations in an unpleasant way. It's like coming out from the... Uh, restaurant or shopping mall and you look at the sea of cars and you think where the hell is the car it's little frustrations like that or the decisions you make all day long i won't do the washing today i'll do the get the car fixed or do something else and then no i can't do that either because it's his birth is you know or some birthday or i've got a, it's the library book drive or i've got to return the car to him. you're always faced every day with some trivial decision at least I am, that I never can decide which to do. Usually wind up doing nothing and sitting down and reading something that has caught my eye. I first met James Thurber in 1945. Alan Bunce, now playing Albert on my show, was married to Ruth Nugent, who was Elliot Nugent's sister. And Elliot had a new play opening on Broadway, and they invited me along. We had dinner at the Algonquin. Very exciting. I didn't see any celebrities. And then we saw the play, which wasn't very good, and afterwards all trooped back to J.C. Nugent's dressing room. He was a well-known actor and Elliot's dad, who was starring in it. Everyone's saying how marvelous he was and how marvelous the play was and so on, as you do. Big crowd. I didn't really know anyone, and I found myself gradually sort of sifted, you know, to the back wall. And by the time I dug into my purse for a cigarette and got that going, I looked up, everyone was gone. Don't know where they all went. Everyone except for a man in very thick glasses sitting in the corner, who I recognized instantly. Hello, I said, so nervous I felt faint. What in Christ's name did you think of that third act, he said. I said, well, actually, I thought the whole thing kind of petered out. Yes, he said, exactly. I told Elliot that. Oh, hell, I'm just sore because he cut out all the lines I gave him. He only left one of them in, but at least it got a laugh. I said maybe the billing should have read, A Place of Our Own, a new play by Elliot Nugent with one funny line by James Thurber. Hello, Ethel, he said. Well, I was so taken aback. I recognize you by your voice, he said. How wonderful to meet you. You got yourself one hell of a swell radio program. It's really goddamn good. (laughs) Thurber and I met up now and again over the years, mostly up in Cornwall, Connecticut, and, uh, well, he'd lost pretty much of what was left of his eyesight by then, and I'd stop by when I could. His wife would call up and say, please get over here, he's in a terrible mood. And then I'd go down and stop there, she asked me, and he asked me. He was in a bad way as he got older, and the, and uh, he was very bitter then, and he was drawing on the wall, couldn't draw on anything smaller than that, see anything. And he said, we should do something together. I knew that was absolutely impossible and pretty absurd anyway. But it was fun to talk to him. He really was nice. And he brightened up when I came, so that cheered me up, you know. The married life of the Arbuckles is not very spectacular. They've settled down at the usual routine like the rest of us. In fact, everything sounds pretty familiar at 444 Edgecombe Road. I got Arbuckle, 
Ethel and Albert Arbuckle from Fatty Arbuckle. I like the name. Well, I liked him in the old silent movies when I was little. He was funny. It wasn't until I was about 30 that somebody said, well, you know what he did, don't you? I said, no, I'd always wondered whatever happened to him. They said, well, he raped a girl at a party with a Coke bottle and it killed her and he was charged. I was so horrified (laughs) that I had glorified him by using his name. Oh, God, I didn't know what to do. Well, it was too late by then to change it. Anyhow, I was feeling for the first time that that we had a real team going. You know, Alan Bunce was wonderful playing Albert. He really was. Well, it took about six months to get into the swing of it, but uh, once you know someone for a while, you learn to write for them. You know, you capitalize on how they speak and so on, but... uh, Alan was simultaneously starring in a soap opera, Young Dr. Malone, which meant he rehearsed that at CBS from 12.30 to 1.10, then rushed over to ABC to us to rehearse Ethel and Albert. We'd go live on the air with our show, then he'd race back over to CBS to do Malone. It was hectic as hell, but we were making it work, just, until the network decided to shift our time slot. Because so many women had written in and said, my husband says he's sick and tired of listening to the second-hand version of Ethel and Albert, and I want him to hear it. Could you put it on in the evening? Well, that was their excuse, anyhow. Probably fit their schedule as far as that concern. And so that's why they put us on at quarter to seven. Which conflicted with young Dr. Malone. So Alan had to make a decision. And luckily, because I tell you, the idea of having to cast for yet another Albert had me so upset I was just sick to my stomach all the time. Alan quit Malone. And as I said before, we went on to work together as Ethel and Albert, mostly happily, for the next 20 years. And on the 13th of March, 1946, our daughter, Susie, was born. She was played by Madeline Pierce, an actress then in her 30s who specialized in children's voices. Susie, come on, get your hands washed and get up in your high chair, dear. Daddy isn't here. Well, you're going to have your dinner in the kitchen tonight, dear, because Mommy and Daddy are having guests. Get your hands washed now. Come on. I want to eat with you. Now, look, I want you to be a good little girl. Honestly, where can Daddy be? I asked him to try and get home a little early tonight. Oh, Albert? Yeah? Oh, just wondering where you were. Get your hands washed. Oh, Daddy! <laughs> oh, Daddy! <laughs> I have just heard one of the funniest stories I ever heard in my life. Oh, have you? Now, even in New York, even in the big time, the goal was to get a sponsor. For your show and we started off on what was called sustaining at ABC meaning without one but to exist for any length of time on network you needed to be sponsored and they paid for the advertising for one thing here's what the ABC network told potential sponsors quote the Ethel and Albert program is not just beam to the housewife alone nor is it just for dad or the youngsters Ethel and Albert is a family show that the whole family enjoys together therefore every sales message of yours reaches the entire family end quote More bang for the buck. But the big difference for me now was that for the first time in my radio career, I didn't have to go find these sponsors or write all that endless driveling ad copy that I've been having to do for years. Listen, I thought I had nothing to do. I said, God, that's all I have to do is write the show F and L once a a day. (laughs) ABC went on what was called cooperative meaning it's all its affiliated stations all over the country had to find their own local sponsors. We had uh, Montgomery Ward in Chicago, Saverin Coffee in New York, something else in Fort Worth, and so on. 141 stations, all told, and believe me, I counted them. Because soon after we'd started, the network made me write to every single one of them personally, apologizing for something Ethel had said on the air. But I hadn't. I really hadn't. I was always very careful, never, never to swear. Well, you had to be. And I said, gosh. Oh, my gosh. And they thought I said, oh, my God. And who complained? I don't know. But I had to write very groveling, humbling, humble letters to the sponsor. And different sponsors all over, so you can imagine the sponsors I had to write. Pearly furs up in Montreal. (laughs) And so on and so on. Cripes. But other than that, the network left me alone. They never butted in. Oh, yes, once. They told me to quickly write a show for the next day talking about FDR, President Roosevelt's death, and how sad Ethel and Albert were. I said, well, I can't say that for 15 minutes. Write the show, they said, and hung up. I can't remember what I did. I know I had the organist play Home on the Range at the end. 
Well, then ABC changed their minds again about our time slot. They put out an announcement saying, do you like it on now or do you want it on a little earlier, back in the old time? And we got 13,000 letters. And I think they put the ad on on Monday. And by Thursday, we had 13,000. These enormous sacks of mail, you know, a yard and a half high with In Defense of Ethel and Albert written on them. ABC had them all delivered down to Gramercy Park, my apartment, and every single letter in those bags said how upset they'd be if my show was moved to two in the afternoon because they'd be out and they wouldn't be able to hear it. One family asking if they were all expected to quit work in order to hear it. Children threatening to stay home from school even. I mean, it was incredible. It really was great publicity, of course. And so, uh, well, with public opinion 100 to 1 in favor of keeping us on at 6.15, ABC, believe it or not, complied. And we stayed there for the next six years, and I wrote a script a day all that time, sometimes more. I had two weeks from typewriter to broadcast, and what I wrote was what they got. I almost never rewrote or edited, ever. But it was always the same, you know, holidays, birthday, it didn't matter. I'd go out for dinner on Christmas Eve, see friends, but no, I had to write a script when I got home. I'd be on the air Christmas Day, then it was back to the apartment to write a script. I mean, even World War II sort of passed me by. I mean, the city was a madhouse when Germany was defeated. I mean, you couldn't hear yourself think. Horns blowing day and night, cars, ships in the harbor. And then again, a few months later when Japan fell, and there's me trying to get my scripts done. Well... I managed. What threw me really wasn't the writing. No, what got to me was the performing, going out live, being heard by millions all over the country and in Canada. And I threw up before everything. But then I didn't eat anything nice and thin in those days. I guess I was nervous. I was more nervous on radio than I was on television for some reason. And no one really understood the pressure. I was always being rushed to death with everybody wanting me to come to this or that lunches, dinners, tickets to plays, feelings hurt if I didn't go or left early, relative, friends of relatives wanting a place to stay, expecting me to drop everything to show them New York and even provide theater tickets, which I know they thought I got free. I was never reimbursed. Well, I never said anything. It always kind of amused me, really, to hear from people I hadn't heard from in years, old friends suddenly remembering me again now that I was on the air, God, so many people are impressed by success, aren't they? Well, hell, I was one of them. I was seeing celebrities every day, but I never got used to it. Just remember, Mother once said to me when I was little, everyone has to go to the bathroom just like you and I do, even the King of England. Well, <laughs> she was right, but I still always felt like a hick from the sticks. I remember Alan Bunce and I came back from lunch one day at a rehearsal, which was in the bowels of the RCA building. And there was two little bank and said, oh, this crummy old wooden bench. And we all looked surprised at it. And then she said, ah, I've been waiting half an hour. And I said, what for? What was you waiting for? Oh, I tell you, I love your show. I couldn't believe it. Well, I was flattered, but I mean, honestly baffled. I, I guess because I never thought I was doing anything special. And then, of course, the greater your success, the greater your problems. Bob Cotton, my producer and director, we got on fine. Mostly. I may get furious with people, but I never stay mad for too long before the whole thing strikes me as rather funny. And besides, I can probably get a script out of it. But if I feel I'm being rooked, I sure as hell speak up. And Cotton, who honest and truly did nothing on my show except wave his hand at the organist to give him a cue, he wanted me to sign an agreement whereby he'd make twice as much money from Ethel and Albert as I would well, for the rest of his life, from what I could tell. And not, not just the radio rights, but for this up-and-coming thing called television, movies, books. He even had his girlfriend getting a piece of the pie. He and a Sheila Dill or Dilly, I didn't even know her. He had themselves listed as the owners of Ethel and Albert. You know, many people in this business are selfish and grasping and revengeful, but many are just plain stupid, aren't they? I got a lawyer in. I had new contracts and agreements drawn up with Cotton and the network, both acknowledging me as sole owner of my show in perpetuity. Nothing's going on, Mother. It seemed I was always having to reassure her. Writing my show as well as acting in it gives me clout. Without the writer, Mother, they have nothing. 
So I don't ever feel I have to be especially nice to any producer or director or higher up bigwig. I can just be myself. It's really no concern of mine whether or not they find me attractive. So please stop worrying. I will not be one of those girls who gets to the top on her bottom. And I shall always wear an iron glove on my silky paw. (laughs) Well, look, let's face it. Men are the same the world over. And most of them made passes, of course, at some point. But I never felt threatened, ever. Well, they might have, but I didn't. Most of them just look so silly, really, don't they? I'd have dinner with a production head of ABC one night. It was a business thing. And at one stage, I asked why Ethel and Albert wasn't being broadcast out on the coast, you know, L.A. Well, he said, reaching over and giving my silky paw a little squeeze, accompanied by what I imagine he thought was a sexy wink. He, uh... Could certainly look into that if I, uh... Well, I managed not to laugh, at least. What, I was going to go to bed with someone just so my Aunt Eva in San Fernando could hear my show? Cripes. Well, by the end of my first year in radio in New York, I'd made over $15,000. In my last year down in Cumberland, I'd made just under $2,000, so it was a big difference. But I was so used to living on $15 a week or less that I didn't spend much. And the ABC Accounts Department well, at least twice, I think more, had to remind me to come in and pick up my paycheck. Christ Christ knows what they thought of me in there. But I now had enough saved up so I could buy Aunt Eva, who was not hearing my show in California, a new toilet. I could pay off my Aunt Helen's debts in St. Paul. I hired a cleaning lady, Myrtle, and I offered to pay mother's rent. Aren't you glad your only child didn't stay behind the reception desk at the clinic now, I wrote to her, knowing she would ignore the question. I don't think Mother ever said... uh, I knew she liked me, but she didn't think much of writing and acting. She was a nurse, and she was very respectful of doctors, needless to say. She worked at the Mayo Clinic, and she had reason to be. But I think she would have have been, I'm sure, happier, really, if I had married a doctor or been a doctor myself. But even if I'd won the Nobel Prize for, I don't know, curing the common cold, which would have been useful, I admit, I catch so many of them, I would still have been getting it in the neck for failing to do something she'd been hounding me about, you know, like washing my curtains or thanking some distant cousin for offering to send me watermelon pickles or something. I finally just had to accept that that was her way. Well, not all was accepted. I'm a busy woman, mother, I wrote to her in 1947. I don't have time to sit down and whack off letters to people I hardly know. And if I do get time, then I'm sick of sitting writing and I want to do something else for a few minutes. I have my work to do. Which reminds me, which imp behind you is sticking you with a pitchfork that you never seem to be satisfied with what I'm doing? Sometimes you refer to Ethel and Albert as almost insignificant. Now you just cut it out. I don't hanker after fame. All my work has been for you to give us financial security and to make you proud, to give you things you wanted to give me. Yes, it would have been wonderful to have known a father who'd lived to see his child, but you've done more than your share in making up for it, and I've got more by having you than most kids who own two parents. And that I had a mother who worked was the finest thing to happen to me. I am not going hog wild now that I'm making money. Your training is obvious. And please send some more bran bread. All my love, To the sweetest and finest person I know, love, Margaret Francis, Maggie Clara, Buster, Pinhead, Peggy Ann, Lynn Fairbanks, Peg, Peggy, Ethel. P.S. Why don't you give up your nursing job at the clinic and come to New York and move in with me? Mother was unhappy. I knew that. I didn't blame her. She'd just been overlooked for promotion again at the clinic, Mayo Clinic, after she'd devoted herself to that place for years, you know, and they offered her something like... $7.50 a weekly pension. I sent her a first-class air ticket, which she refused, saying I was being extravagant. So I managed to get a jump on my scripts, and after my show on Friday, I flew to Minnesota for the weekend to try and persuade her. That was my first plane ride. I didn't expect anybody but Lindbergh to be flying the damn thing. (laughs) I was scared. We got to the Buffalo airport, landed for gas in Buffalo from New York, and I saw a man in uniform, and I said, uh, aren't you one of the Hoffman twins from Rochester? And he said, yes, you're Margaret Lynch, Peg Lynch. I said, yes. And uh, 
he, he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm flying home. Pick my mother. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm flying you home. Well, I tell you, I almost didn't get on the plane. And that's the truth. The Hoffman twins back in school had to have been just about the dumbest, stupidest things going. Neither of them with enough sense to come in out of the rain. I thought, I'm trusting my life to this clunk. Oh, God, I tell you. Well, we got there in one piece, fortunately. And I talked Mother into quitting her job. It wasn't really that hard. And before I flew back, I gave her a hand starting to pack up her apartment. And um, I'm going to digress here for a minute. I do that a lot, I am told. But um, Mother and I were cleaning out her small attic preparatory to her coming. And she's, I said to this, well, what is this, what is this hat? That I think my dad wouldn't have worn. Oh, she said, that's Jesse James's hat. Very briefly, Emily Lynch, Grandma Lynch, on September 7th, 1876, she was 16 years old, and she was working in a field with her brothers near Northfield, Minnesota, when the James brothers and the younger brothers pulled up on their horses to ask directions. Seeing they were armed, and figuring something was afoot, the Lynches downed tools and raced off cross-country to Northfield, arriving just as the gang came tearing out of the bank after robbing it. Jesse crashed into Emily, and they both tumbled into the dirt. Emily got up, furious, grabbed Jesse by his jacket, and flung him into the elderberry bushes. She was six foot four and a formidable force, even at 16. Next time you come to Northfield, she said, bring your manners. Somebody yelled, Jesse, come on, and he jumped on his horse and galloped off, minus his hat, which Emily picked up. Now, when we tell a story at the family reunion, uh, the, it got stopped dead. When you, then she picked him up and tossed him into the elderberry bushes. That's always interrupted by somebody in the family. No, Maud, it was not elderberry bushes. I knew that corner very well. They, they had Pacassandra there. <laughs> then they, somebody else said, no, it was bridal wreath, I think, and about 15 <laughs> minutes of gardening. <laughs> Emily kept the hat hanging on a hook in her room all her life maybe expecting Jessie to come back and get it, I don't know. And when she died, Mother inherited it. It was just in her things, that's all, in the attic, and I picked it up. And I said, well, aren't you going to keep it? And Mother said, who would want that dirty old thing? She said, no, 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 throw it out. Throw it in the trash. So I'm almost afraid to say it, but I always did what I was told. I'm sorry to report, I threw the hat out. Never occurred to me that it might be valuable. Cripes. So who am I to judge the Hoffman twins, you know? Well, I spent the next few months doing my show, of course, but also scrubbing my apartment from top to bottom, shelves, drawers, woodwork, waxing the floors, even getting new slip covers and drapes, getting it up to scratch for Mother's arrival. It was hot, 97 degrees. I loved it, having grown up always cold, but I was being chewed to ribbons by the mosquitoes. When getting any sleep, I was so sick of the eternal round of getting bitten, waking, snapping on the light, grabbing my slipper, and then swatting the fattened bug, that I marched over to Abercrombie & Fitch and asked for the mosquito netting department. Is Madam off on safari? The salesman asked. Yes, I said, to Gramercy Park. And I came home with miles of white stuff that I strung a cord through and tied one end to the heating pipe and sort of tucked the rest around me, you know, after I got into bed, and it was marvelous, until about 2 a.m. when I woke up to go to the bathroom and I couldn't seem to get out of bed. I flailed and flailed. I know what was going on, panicking. Then saw what I thought was a ghost waving its arms at me and let out a yell, terrified, heart pounding. It was, of course, me under the damn netting, reflected in the mirror on the back of my bedroom door. Honestly, so typical of me. Anyway, anyway, I got the screens installed on all windows the next day, and I got a script out of the whole thing. Mother loved... New York. Loved the apartment. Loved being with me. About the size of it. I brought her to my show. Everybody made a fuss. I took her shopping, out to dinners, to the theater. Her youngest sister, my Aunt Elise, was in medical school up at Columbia studying to be a doctor. Mother was very proud of her. And I took them to see Voice of the Turtle, a matinee, one afternoon on Broadway. And I was sitting there watching and I suddenly thought, God, I'd forgotten what this was all about, you know, illicit weekend and all that sort of stuff. And I said, uh, I whispered to my aunt, I'd forgotten the play was so... (laughs) And uh, 
she said, oh, don't worry about it. Your mother doesn't care how dirty the play is as long as the theater is clean. <laughs> <laughs> Only funny thing Elise ever said, wasn't this? Well, it seems that Mother had only hesitated about moving in with me because she didn't want to be in the way in case I got married. Married, I said. Fat chance of that, 31 and still single. The horror of being an old maid hung over me every single day, really. And I wanted children, lots of them, 10 at least. But who would I marry? I may have convinced myself I'd been in love a dozen times. I knew in my heart I hadn't never finding exactly what I wanted in a man. Uh, although I tell you, when I got a fan letter from a Swedish radio officer on the Gripsholm, a liner ship off across the Atlantic exchanging prisoners of war or something like that, who wrote to me to say he'd fallen in love with my voice because it was so sweet. Well, I nearly married him sight unseen. You know, it was the first person who'd ever said anything nice about it. But no, there, there always seemed to be something lacking in every single man I met or something there I didn't like. Too old, too young, stupid, drinks, an ass, nice but devoid of personality, crackpot, idiot, unavailable. I'd written to Mother a few years earlier saying, If ever I meet a man like Alan Bunce, that's the man I'm going to marry. <laughs> I had a big crush on Alan, and it was, well, he was married with three beautiful children, and, uh, I didn't believe anyone should break up a marriage. You know, I just didn't. Granted, my ardor did cool somewhat when he told me he'd never read a book in his life, not one, ever. I tried to get him to read Animal Farm. He never got past the first page. He was very right-wing. I just avoided the subject of politics. But uh, no, I didn't think anyone has the right to break up a marriage. Is about the size of it. Uh, I, uh, I dashed out for a drink of water in the hall outside our studio in the RCA building and afterwards held the button down on the water fountain, you know, just politely for whoever was behind me and uh, said something, can't remember what, but whatever it was, this man having a drink looked up at me and laughed. He looked so familiar. I couldn't think who he was. Anyhow, I did my show and when I came out to go home, there he was, leaning against the wall next to the water fountain, arms folded, smiling. And he said, I've been standing here for two hours waiting for you to get thirsty again. Well, I laughed and said, I don't know what. He laughed. And we got to talking about what a beautiful evening it was. It was like the first day of spring or something like that. And he said, I feel like going around the park, Central Park. I've never gone around the park in one of those horse and carriages. And I said, God, I never have either. And he said, let's do it. And we did. He, uh, he really had an entrancing smile. I must admit that really looked cute. And we took the buggy ride. And then we had dinner. And then over the next few weeks, had more dinners after my show. Uh, he was one of the funniest men, really, I've ever met. Not witty, particularly, but amusing, fun. We laughed constantly. He was a nice guy, too. He really was. Out of all the celebrities I've ever met, the nicest. And he read. He was bright. But he'd always been cast for his looks. You know, by his own admission, he wasn't the greatest of actors. But his, uh, his fans didn't care. He'd just be mobbed. Everywhere we went, they wouldn't leave him alone, so we didn't go out that much. He had a uh, <laughs> he had an awful little fake mustache he'd sometimes wear as a disguise that made him look like a used car salesman. We were at the Hearthstone around the corner from Gramercy Park one time having dinner, and when he got up to go to the bathroom, a woman at the next table leaned over and said, "We think your husband looks just like." <laughs> And I said, pretending to be appalled, Oh, really? I hope not. He's awful. <laughs> My best friend, Nancy Moore, she was a writer in New York. We spoke every day, chatted. You know what she said when she found out about him, when I told her who it was? She said, God, what's he seeing you? Well, that was kind of mean, really. I'll tell you who he was. I, I will, but not now. Not now. We stayed friends for quite a while over the years, and... Um, Anyway, he arranged his filming schedule then in Hollywood so that he could spend one week a month in New York. And I, uh, we, took a lease on a small studio apartment in McDougal's Alley down in the village, Greenwich Village. There's nothing illicit. You know, I wasn't married. He wasn't. He was either divorced or officially separated. I can't remember. But I had my mother living with me now, you know. And McDougal's Alley was darling. 
It really was. Red geraniums in the window boxes. It was right down near the building where they had all these apartments. I, I can't think how many they had, six or ten or, you know, something like that. And they were just they were just for people who were living together or having an affair and they didn't want it known, you know, celebrities. Tracy and Hepburn. I saw Leonard Bernstein there quite a lot. Can't remember who he was with, though. And there was a restaurant there in the building, too. And we go there, private. It's a club. You know, you couldn't just walk in off the street. Well, after six months or so, maybe less, he said, um, let's get married. I didn't know what to do. He was a movie star, and there was no getting away from that, you know. Well, and we talked about it, and we talked about it, and we were about to buy a house up in Nyack, New York. And uh, when I flew to L.A. to see someone about a film script, uh, nothing ever came of it. And we had a horrible experience at Chasen's. It really affected me. We were having dinner, and right in the middle of it, these two women, girls, really, approached. I thought they wanted his autograph. Do you know what they did? It all happened so fast. One of them pinned his arms behind his chair and the other unzipped his pants and pulled out his, you know, and leaned down and put it in her mouth right there in the middle of the crowded restaurant. I was so flabbergasted I couldn't move for a second, but I I managed to leap up and yanked her by the hair, pulling her up. And by that time, people were running over, waiters, customers, the maitre d'ers. It made me sick to my stomach the whole thing, because uh, that's not the life I wanted. I didn't. uh, Besides, I had my career, and that was in New York. And there was Alan. I knew I was never going to marry him, but we were working together almost every day. And I couldn't even grab a Coke, you know, at the soda fountain downstairs, killing time with the sound effects man without Alan getting in a snit. He was so jealous. I mean, it's all so silly, really. And, And then, it seems like I keep saying this, and then the phone rang. But it did. And I was at the typewriter, as usual, frantically trying to finish a script. But I picked it up, and I heard, What? I said. This voice said again. Well, we went back and forth and back and forth like that for a while until finally I understood this man to be saying, This is Odd Canute Ronning from Norway. Thick accent. Now, in Odd's version of this phone call... He says he then heard me cover the phone, but not very well, and yelled to someone, It's some cousin from Norway. Do we have enough lamb chops to ask him for dinner? Well, I don't want to give it away, but you can't leave us hanging. Did they have enough lamb chops? Did he he stay for dinner? James, he stayed for over 60 years. 60 years. That's the next episode of The Private Life of Beg Lynch. One more thing, because I know we're going to get letters. Fatty Arbuckle was wrongly accused. He got a raw deal. So the fact that the Arbuckles were named after Fatty is okay.